Uh, good morning. I'm Ernie Bauer, the Senior Advisor and Director of the Southeast Asia Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we're very fortunate to have with us this morning the uh, Ambassador of Australia to the United States, Kim Beasley. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, Ernie. You, uh, congratulations. You've got a new government uh, down in Canberra, and uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, how did that government get formed, uh, and could you talk a little bit about um, the personalities? Uh, you got a new prime minister, a new foreign minister. Um, we'd love to hear uh, how that process uh, took place. I detected a certain irony in your congratulations, Ernie, and, uh, and I find that irony is totally appropriate because we are an, in an uncharted territory in Australian politics. We've not had a minority government in these circumstances in Australia in its history. There have been minority governments before, but the the, uh, the numbers of uh, independents that, uh, on whose votes a government had to rely were much smaller in number than is the case here. So this is a minority government that has been formed, a government which will have to conduct itself with great diplomatic skill uh, over the course of the three years if the t parliament is to run its full course. Uh, they're going to be negotiating with forces, uh, or with, with groups or individuals of very different ideological persuasions, some to the left of the government, some to the right of the government, some indeed in some circumstances to the right of the opposition. <laughs> and, um, and, and then there's the opposition. I, I think there's, you're going to see lots of new phenomena in Australian politics aside from the negotiation with the independents. I think it probably will behove the government to negotiate with the opposition too. <laughs> So there's, there's going to be a level of consensus building in Australian politics that there's never been before. What, what's going to be the impact on, on Australia's foreign policy if you're, you're dealing with, as you say, you're, you're into new territory here? Well, I'd like to be able to say that the impact would be negligible. Um, if you take a look at the majority, if you like, of the parliament, the overwhelming majority of the parliament, is supportive of the American Alliance, for example. Probably the overwhelming majority of the parliament is supportive of the, uh, the policies that both parties have pursued towards engagement with or enmeshment with the Asian region uh, around Australia. These are things which have become pretty heavily settled in principle mm. in Australian politics, if not necessarily in detail. Having said that, uh, there has been a, an indication by the government of a willingness to allow uh, some of the minority uh, parties or individuals, the Greens for example, uh, a willingness to put into the parliament foreign policy and defence matters for debate. That is not for resolution, mm. but for debate. And um, uh, in the House of Representatives, as opposed to the Senate, which is all, for most of it, the time I've been actively interested in politics has, has been a, uh, a, a Senate where, in which the government's in a minority. Uh, in the House of Representatives, foreign policy and defence policies have really been debated mm. in Australia. Well, they will be debated now. And so that will be provide an opportunity, I guess, for more diverse views than have been heard in the House before to be heard such as Australia's engagement in Afghanistan, yeah. for instance? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, the government is very supportive of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the government's engagement in Afghanistan. It's recently been effectively renegotiated with the Americans in the light of the withdrawal of the Dutch from Oriskan province. Mm -hmm. uh, that has involved uh, a step up by the Australians in their engagement in Oriskan. And they've also uh, indicated a pretty long-term commitment from the government in regard to that. Uh, I, doubt, I don't think that's going to change, that won't change. But the willingness to discuss it, hear alternative points of view, that will occur. Historians and analysts uh, could point to a, a period of time where you actually uh, put the importance of the uh, alliance with the United States on your shoulders and, and needed to sort of remind the body politic of Australia, that how important that was, or, you know, I, is that a fair, uh, well, is that a fair statement? And, and might that, might we need that sort of a 
leadership again. That was a long time ago. <laughs> then. When, I, when I was uh, was doing that sort of thing, I was uh, I was then defence minister. I was the, I, I have the distinction of being the last Cold War defence minister mm. in Australia. I was there when the Berlin Wall came down as defence minister, and the last few years of the of the Cold War were pretty fraught. And the source of often angry debate inside the communities, particularly in the anti-nuclear movement, and because we hosted, and still do, uh, joint facilities of some relevance to the American deterrent and the overall, uh, overall nuclear posture, that certainly drew a degree of hostile attention in the public, and it's up to the Defence Minister to defend it. I think alliances always have to be refreshed. I think they change their character as the, as the political dynamic of global politics changes its character, and it is, and has, uh, in the aftermath of the Cold War, then you need to keep before the public all the time the, the value that the relationship has. One of the problems you've got with doing that uh, with Australians is that an awful lot of what we do that makes the American alliance critical to Australia is done with reasonably high levels of classification. Mm. Um, when I became ambassador, one of the things I discovered is that we are probably now vastly more intensively engaged with the American intelligence services than we were, uh, important though our connections were at the time when, when I was defence minister. I also find too that the revolution in military affairs has produced a quantum leap in the value of the ability that we have to acquire uh, American equipment and the mechanisms with uh, which it operates. And, and so that is even more important to Australia now. And while, while that can be discussed publicly, um, it's not easy to discuss it understandably. Sure. So, uh, so that's a... Uh, that's something that is going to be there on the plate of the Defence Minister and the, to a lesser extent the Foreign Minister now, but in a sense I don't think the dynamics of Australian politics have changed that, that much. It's really the, the broader external circumstances which have. An issue that I'm getting at is, you know, I think when the Obama administration came into power, uh, they, the Asia policy team probably could have taken for granted uh, the uh, the relationship and the, yeah. the uh, alliance with Japan that they thought that that was sort of a rock to mm -hmm. build on and that they would be dealing with sort of an emergent China turns out that um, we are dealing with an emergent China emergent China but the the alliance with Japan is was not an easy issue uh, to to sort of cope with and is there any chance based on sort of the new political dynamic in Australia that that the United States needs to up its game um, in, in helping to describe that value uh, or underline that value to Australia? I think it's, it's always important for the United States to pay its mind and to engage us and to uh, take seriously the, the views that we express and to express to us mm. in turn the serious views of the United States. It is always useful for the United States to brace its allies and say what it expects of them. And um, I, I have noticed that they're pretty good at it. Um, I, think the, I, I think it's true to say that the Clinton administration has been more deeply engaged in Southeast Asia than any American administration in recent memory. You mean the Obama administration? Oh, sorry, the Obama administration, yeah. the Clinton, Clinton secretary. Right. Yeah has been more deeply engaged and the, uh, the Obama administration more deeply engaged than, um, than anyone that I can rec reflect on or recollect in recent times, which is a very, very gratifying thing. I think you actually find at the moment now that Australian uh, political leadership will be quite pleased with the directions of the Obama administration and the engagement with, they've had, with one exception. Yeah. I want to see the President. Right. So there will be a, uh, a, a bit of a, uh, a push on, I suspect, over the next months to uh, try to get the President's uh, proposed uh, visit to reject. Yeah, well, it, I guess in that sense, uh, there, there might be a little tension 
if the president visits uh, in, uh, Indonesia uh, in November. Uh, originally he planned to visit Indonesia and Australia together on several of the attempted mm. past trips. Uh, is that going to be a problem in Australia? Well, that, that will require explanation, if and when that occurs. Okay. Um, and uh, if, if, if that were to happen, uh, naturally we'd, we'd love him to come on from uh, Indonesia to Australia. But uh, these things are always open to discussion and settlement. Above all, what we'd want would be a really good visit. Right. Um, in terms of new, new uh, issues, or not new issues, but issues that may have a different, a bit of a different angle under, between the Rudd uh, government and the uh, Gillard government, um, is climate change going to be uh, any different now that the Green Party has exacted some promises from uh, Julia Gillard? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the dynamics of it will change a little. I, I, don't, I think we've got to be, re I, I would be realistic about that. Mm -hmm. uh, already the Gillard government has said that they will enter into a discussion with the Greens about it. The committee is being set up. The committee is going to look at carbon pricing, among other things. Um, and that is, uh, I, I think you're going to see uh, not an absolute change from the previous government, but the climate change issues drifting back into centre stage again. They were at centre stage uh, for a period of time yeah. under the Rudd government. Never really left centre stage. They just the the effects of Copenhagen were to uh, cause a bit of rethink. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the, the high priority will be sustained, but with a slightly different political dynamic. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about the new cabinet lineup? You know, some of the key, uh, the key ministers. Uh, obviously, we, you know, the foreign minister is not, not a new face. Um, mm. um, and, of course, the you know, foreign, previous foreign ministers moved over to defense. But could you talk about some of the key positions and, and how you think that team dynamic will work? Well, firstly, you've got the new Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. Uh, she's a known quantity in Washington. She's been here several times as Deputy Prime Minister. She's a great friend of the Education uh, Secretary here. Okay. Um, but that goes with the previous portfolio. Um, she will... Uh, she is appreciative of the American Alliance. She has some, some level of foreign policy expertise herself. And she will want to play a central role in the... Uh, character of the relationship between the United States and Australia. So she'll be there. That's good to hear. Um, then there's, uh, and she's of course chairman of the National Security Committee of the Cabinet. Uh, then there is the uh, Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd, who's a formidable uh, presence uh, in our region and in relationships with the Obama administration. Um, and uh, his visit recently, I think, uh, re demonstrated that. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Trade Minister. In our, in our system, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade are a combined department, right. Craig Emerson. He is an uh, absolutely top-notch economist. Uh, he is a formidable intellect in himself. And there was a... Uh, I've just had him here also over the oh. last couple of days uh, on trade issues. Mm -hmm. And I, one has a little suspicion that trade issues might become quite prominent in the next year or so. Um, as uh, as the new Congress emerges and uh, things which have been held off the agenda suddenly come pretty firmly on the agenda, uh, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, like the Korean Free Trade Agreement, and hopefully from our point of view, the DOFA round. So that's those two. Then on the, uh, the defence side, uh, Stephen Smith was the Foreign Minister, now the Defence Minister. Stephen Smith comes from Western Australia, as I did myself. Mm. West Australians are natural defence ministers <laughs> because we are natural botherers <laughs> about uh, the security of uh, the country. Then the junior minister in the defence portfolio, uh, Jason Clare, is one of the rising stars of the Labor Party. And he has a, the, the junior minister always ha has a special responsibility in the area of procurement. Mm. And... Um, so they really test themselves out in that. This is a potentially very powerful national security team. Um, and uh, it, you, you'd like to think, with the, with the caveats that I've already put on it in terms of the debate on Afghanistan and that sort of right. thing, 
that by and large national security policy will be as it has been historically a little off to one side of the mainstream of the political process in Australia where while it would be un unreal to say that the two sides strive for absolute bipartisanship they do strive for sufficient bipartisanship and therefore there's not too many challenges to the capacity of the uh, relevant national security ministers to do their job. Mm. So domestic politics and, and that survival instinct to keep a, a tenuous coalition together mm. won't detract from uh, you know what we've come to expect here in the United States as a very forward deployed uh, thoughtful Australian foreign policy. Well, can I make one thing absolutely clear? There is no coalition. There is a minority government. All right. And um, the uh, and that is a bit different, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. A slightly different dynamic. Um, Australians want to be forward. Uh, it, it's a thing not well understood about modern Australia, but modern Australia probably uh, is more uh, deeply engaged than... Uh, most other countries of an equivalent economy. Just to cite one statistic, I suppose, which would be helpful in, in, uh, in seeing that. Mm -hmm. I guess the percentage of our GDP, which is made up of foreign trade, would be twice that of the United States. And um, we, we are now, where do we make our reputation? Well, we're now the world's biggest coal export the world's biggest uranium exporter. ConocoPhillips is gradually effectively Australianising its operations. Mm. Uh, believes that in the next 15 years will be the world's largest natural gas exporter. Uh, we have the third or fourth largest amount of funds under management in the globe, but we have only one and a half percent of the global economy. So we have to massively invest overseas. You can't invest all that in Australia. And this, this, the United States is our loco, location of choice on, uh, on investment. So for the first time last year, Australian direct investment in the United States surpassed, in that year, new investment, American direct investment in Australia. And, and we heavily invest in the ASEAN states and uh, in the region around us. Australia is probably, I would say the mind of the average Australian is far more internationally engaged than the mind of the average American. Right, that's the point I was going to ask. Yeah. You, you mm. as party leader and leader of the opposition, mm. you would you'd know, uh, you know, in, in our country I think it's a gap, you know, between policy and, and politics. Uh, but you're saying in Australia, the Australians the man in the street, he's wired to support this sort of a forward deploy. Uh, yeah, he is policy. pretty much. Look, look don't, don't let me sell you a bill of goods here. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, we're talking here comparatively. You know, if, if, if you ask the average Australian and the average American what worried him well, or her, mm -hmm. well, it's the family, it's sure. the neighbourhood, it's the community. Uh, these are the things, uh, the day-to-day -day struggle for uh, human existence. These are the things which concern them, and in that, uh, there's no real difference. But Australians relate that to Chicago the, or Sydney. Australians relate that survive those issues. Yeah. That maybe their job to the world market, more, whereas an American might not. Much more so. I see. So, so there'll be a, at least, but if you ask them. I tell you, you're talking out of the back of your hat. <laughs> oh, no, we're not interested in that. We're interested in, you know, what's going on down the street. But the reality is they are. Okay. Um, let's go back to the, the national security team, including, the, mm. the, and particular, particularly maybe the prime minister mm. and the foreign minister. Yep. Um, these are two people that, that you know well. I mean, the three yep. of you sort of led your party. Um, can they get along in, in managing foreign policy and, and who shows up where and, and all that good stuff? I actually think that it will probably be a little easier for them than it was for President Obama and Secretary Clinton. And both of them have done magnificently. You know, it's a, uh, 
th there's no doubt about it at all. He's a deeply engaged president, including in foreign policy matters, and a deeply engaged Secretary of State, and they're moving in tandem, not in collision. Uh, the Australian system is not the same. The Australian system does not pit uh, alternative leaders of a party in bitter dispute right around the nation saying the most terrible things about each other during the course of a uh, primary election campaign and then have to smooth it over if, if subsequently a rival is included in the uh, administration that emerges. The challenges for President Obama and Secretary Clinton are infinitely greater. Mm. And the challenges for, for Prime Minister Gillard and Foreign Minister Rudd, because they're in the Westminster system, where the people vote not for individuals but for the party, mm. and where the party then subsequently in its caucus determines who will lead. How is the Labour Party uh, after these elections? Is you? Uh you know the inner workings of it very mm. well. Is it is it healthy? Does it how does it pull itself back together? And well, I, I think there is a uh, uh, an appreciation on both sides in politics, both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party. Liberal Party who nearly won, mm. actually got the same number of seats as the Labor Party. That what is required over the next three years is extraordinary discipline, mm. discipline beyond the experience of any of them. And you're going to get a very disciplined opposition, and that is going to, in turn, produce a very disciplined government. Mm. Good to hear it. Um, earlier this week, Foreign Minister Rudd visited Washington, uh, and he said that the, the Trade Minister was here also, as well as a team for defense-related discussions with the Americans. Could you tell us a little bit about those visits and, and what's, on the, what's on the agenda? Yes, well, it's a very good visit by, uh, uh, by Foreign Minister Rudd. Uh, very good discussions with Secretary Clinton and with assorted other American officials both uh, in the White House and in the intelligence services. It was an opportunity uh, for, uh, for the, uh, the Foreign Minister, I think, to sort of roll out again that he's back in town. Mm -hmm. So all the things you'd expect to have been discussed, you know, from the regional affairs to, uh, to some of the sort of issues that the uh, that the uh, President specifically concerned himself with, like the G20, like nuclear proliferation, these sorts of things. Uh, all of them were, were, were rolled out again for, the, for discussion as um, uh, the Foreign Minister was there to assure Americans that the, um, that the things that are important to them were basically still in place. He was uh, graced, or the President graced the uh, the visit by uh, turning up when he was seeing um, the National Security Advisor General Jones, mm. which was lovely. Uh, That's it was great. good that, uh, that that occurred. So I'd say things from there looked in, in, in pretty good shape. The uh, officials' discussions were uh, a feature of a regular commitment that we have to for uh, what they call poll mill talks. Uh, these tend to canvas the array of strategic concerns that uh, the two sides have and a chance to exchange views. The discussions in the Australian and American case always operate at a high level of sophistication and um, with considerable intimacy and, um, and considerable knowledge mm. in advance of what each other is likely to say because we inform ourselves well about each other at that, uh, that level. They're not going, they were not as significant a set of talks as what will occur and was announced during the Foreign Minister's visit, and that is the so-called Osmin talks in, uh, uh, on the 8th of November. That's two plus two, Secretary Gates, Secretary Clinton, with uh, Foreign Minister Rudd and uh, Defence Minister Smith. That's. Uh, they're going to be pretty important. Um, they tend to reflect the essential military character of the alliance. The alliance is in the first instance, not an alliance simply of people who are hail fellow well met and think, that, think alike or look alike or whatever in, uh, and have, uh, have like-minded attitudes. It's basically a hard-nosed military alliance. So you tend to find that the hard-nosed military issues 
are, uh, are there on the table, which gives the defence area a slightly higher prominence in diplomacy than it usually gets. Mm. So, uh, last question: What's if, if you could sort of sum up? You know, what's what's different now? Now that between the the Rudd government and and, and now the Gillard government, what's changed and and uh, where are we headed? What's different is uncharted political waters. Mm. That's what's different. Uh, in policy terms, there is no difference. Okay. At least none that I've been able to discern at this stage. Uh, in debate terms, there is a bit of difference. Yeah, there will be more issues debated in the House of Representatives. But what, uh, where this leads is how long this parliament will last. Um, well, these are things that we I can't draw your attention to the historical precedents to give you advice. Mm. The only thing that one can do is to uh, advise by inference and common sense. Um, the government will, uh, as will their opponents on the Liberal Party side, be incredibly disciplined. Because if they're not incredibly disciplined, they'll be incredibly dead. <laughs> and um, that's a... Uh, there are no, there's no margins. There's no margins for indulgence. And um, no margins really for error. And so uh, in those circumstances, you might actually get quite a good government. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Ambassador. I appreciate you joining us today, and we hope to have you back uh, regularly. Thank you for joining us.